First of all, I have to, uh, to mention a warning. Uh, you are here at your own risk. Given the fact that Jim had this problem in expecting to come to the lecture, I don't know what can happen to you that you are here now. So, <laughs> um, the outline, what I would like to do is first of all explain why random walk and uh, through droplets, powders and flames. Uh, if you have looked at uh, the invitation, uh, it mentions about uh, the issue that you can observe a lot by watching, and I'd like to uh, explain that, uh, provide then some examples on each one of the three subjects, uh, mention briefly the future, and uh, the most important thing at the end, uh, to acknowledge everybody who has contributed, sometimes even without knowing it, to my random trajectory. And first of all, to avoid any issues with uh, plagiarism and uh, so on getting me, uh, I'm using a definition which comes from uh, Wikipedia and uh, actually I mention it. So if you look at the definition, uh, effectively it is a mathematical formulation which allows you to uh, develop a trajectory uh, in successive random steps in time. And it has been used in many different applications over the years, uh, including finances, uh, and probably most commonly there. And uh, some examples, again, coming from Wikipedia, you can see random work of molecules, so even in art, uh, that has been calculated by using a computer uh, model. And uh, even you can see some organization in it out of the randomness. And uh, you can use a random walk now for droplets or particles or flames. And this is an example of some trajectories of uh, particles, but you can do that for even fluid particles in flames. So this brings me closer to the subject that I am talking, but this is really a random walk through droplets, powders, and flames. And the reason for that is because I have worked in different areas throughout the years. And uh, the most important thing that has determined the, the randomness of this work is related to the financial support. And uh, uh, there is no other explanation. However, I have to filter out some of this randomness so that I can keep the talk uh, <laughs> together and make sense. So coming to the fact that uh, why this is important, uh, it comes actually from a surprising person, uh, Yogi Berra. Uh, I don't know him and uh, I don't definitely watch baseball. Uh, but uh, actually when it comes to research, the most important thing that somebody must have is to be able to observe a lot by watching. And uh, what I would like to do today is also to, to use exactly this principle and demonstrate either experiments or computations and how you actually use those to uh, gain insights to uh, different engineering problems. So I start the random walk. The random walk usually you throw a dice and you select the state that you have, which is what I did. And you don't always get the right answer because instead of getting droplets, powders and flames, you, it is random. and you get laser techniques. And the laser techniques was the first thing that I did uh, when I came here for a PhD. I was not expecting to be doing that. And actually, I couldn't understand why physics are important. But uh, when I came, as Doug mentioned already, uh, I worked on uh, developing the phase Doppler. Uh, so effectively, you have two laser beams crossing. And if they do, uh, you have a fringe pattern. If you put a droplet in it, this fringe pattern gets focused and you have a projection in space of this fringe pattern. You change the diameter of the droplet and you change the spacing of the fringes and in this way you can measure the droplet size. This is a photograph of this fringe pattern, a fringe pattern which is not as regular as it looks there. 
Uh, and uh, you need to decide how to actually put it to the instrument together. So you need to do some light scattering calculations and predict the fringe pattern, which actually is not as clear as you expect. But eventually you can get uh, the instrument to operate in a way that you have a linear relation between diameter and face, and in this way you can measure the diameter. As you were doing that, you actually were using uh, some glass plate to put particles on it, and uh, you were magnifying to see what the size of the particles were so that you can calibrate the phase Doppler. And as I was doing that, I thought, okay, why not to measure the particles in this way? And uh, this instrument came up where you do have, again, the two lasers crossing. You put the particle in it. You refocus the particle at this position. You put a microscope objective in front. You project it on a, a diode array, which you see here. And effectively, what you have in this position is this image where you have the lasers, which are red around, and this shadow, which is the particle in the middle. And uh, as this particle crosses, you measure the shadow. And from that, you can derive what was the shape and so on. So the, these two instruments, at least, were point instruments. Uh, they would provide measurements at one specific point. And because I don't want uh, to make a mess of the random walk, I want to take the laser techniques out at this stage. And basically, what happened after that is that if you want really to watch something, you can do it better if you have planar measurements instead of point measurements. And as a consequence, we moved from point to uh, planar whole field type of measurements. There was a certain uh, range of techniques that were developed. And those that are in blue, they were actually novel instrumentation uh, contribution. And some of them led to patents. So we throw the dice again, and this time what comes out is everything, powder, droplets, and flames. And this is related to measurements in coal powders or liquid fuel uh, flames. And uh, this is an example of measurements point at this stage with phase Doppler of the spray, which in this case is introduced with no air, other airflow. Uh, this is the spray which is introduced in the wake of this disk. And this is a flame that you have as a consequence. And if you measure the droplet sizes, you actually find that the small droplets actually follow the flow, while if you increase the size, they follow less and less the uh, vortices that are present. So the droplet size is important. You go to a different type of combustor, which is a swelling, uh, it has a swelling airflow, and you inject the fuel in the middle. You take measurements again, and you find that 10 micron, 6 micron droplets, 60 micron droplets move in a different way. And eventually, this is related to some inertial time scale over a certain flow time scale, which allows you to quantify what you would expect. But at the end, in a swelling combustor, the large droplets are centrifuged away. And as a consequence, a lot of the fuel goes at a different position than where you expect it to go. You move in a cold combustion, and at that time it was related to CGB still existed. So this is a, a flame, and these are trajectories of cold particles. And actually, again, by using the shadow doppler, you take measurements inside, and uh, you have uh, profiles of velocities for different uh, particle sizes. And actually, what you find is that you have this conceptual model of a fountain effect, where large droplets actually move further away, while the smaller get trapped into this recirculation zone, and this helps to stabilize the flame. So moving on, uh, and moving a bit away from combustion, you look now at droplets which uh, hits the surface, and we look at only droplets. And uh, when you do that, uh, you start looking for different applications, one of them is cleaning in place. So you have these big tanks in industry where you have, you produce ice cream or whatever, and uh, this, uh, you have these nozzles which actually rotate, and they go around the tank to clean whatever you have, and eventually they have a clean surface. But these liquid jets which hit the surface, they have a purpose to remove the material, 
But at the same time, you want to do that without redepositing uh, contaminated droplets at a different surface. So the question is how you can clean the surface well uh, by having continuous impact of droplets, a continuous jet. Also, if you get splashing, that is a problem because these droplets may go somewhere else. So this time we did the calculations instead of experiments. And actually, the experiments that you see, which are those, are uh, coming from a different group. And uh, we developed the computational method, uh, which is based on the boundary element, so that you can see how the droplet moves and compare it with the experiment. And uh, I go in steps. So the droplet hits the surface. The crown starts to form. And you can see that the calculations predict the same structure. Again, uh, the crown develops further, even more. And uh, the at this stage, the droplet starts breaking off. And in principle, the small droplets that are formed are the splash droplets. And these have a small size, which is about 10% of the initial droplet impact. And uh, because you are interested in uh, cleaning the surface, and uh, the important thing is to know what is the pressure that the droplet generates as it hits this wall. So you cannot measure easily that. And that's why you do the calculations. And this is how the pressure changes. So the red color is high pressure as the droplet hits the surface. And you want actually to break uh, the material that you have if it is a crust. And uh, this uh, part of the crown that uh, is significant for the reatomized, the splash droplets, is actually formed because of the pressure field, which you can see that pushes this out. And eventually, you form the crown. So, Having looked at that, then uh, you go and you look at the impingement of a fuel spray on uh, the inlet valve of a car. And actually, you measure the droplet sizes that you have on top of this plate. And you find that although the initial droplet diameter was 100 microns, you do have droplets which are bigger. They are 140, 120. And you think, but the single impact shows to me that I have only small droplets that are formed. So what is the origin of the large droplets? So you then go and study the physics of multi-droplet impacts on surfaces. And uh, this is a particle which is one micro millimeter in diameter. And you have two droplet streams that actually hit the surface. You have two crowns that are formed. And as these crowns interact, you form this hump in the middle. And you start getting larger droplets generating from that. Or you can have a sound head of droplets, so full monodispersed, 50 micron cones. You can see them hitting a surface. And you can see that you have crowns interactions. Also, the droplets uh, reatomize a liquid film that you have on the surface. And all these generate larger droplets than the single impact can generate. Moving to atomization of liquids, again related to droplets. The, we can move to rocket engines. And this is part of the work that we did uh, on the space shuttle, which is actually due to now to for the last flight. So what you have at the back of the space shuttle is these three hoods. Uh, this is one of those. If you look at what exists at the top, it is what you see here, which is the main engine. And these are the auxiliary part around the engine, which supply the liquid oxygen and hydrogen so that you burn it and generate thrust. And if you look at the photograph of what this has, it has about 200 injectors, which are about one millimeter diameter. And you inject uh, liquid oxygen in the middle and hydrogen around. And hopefully, they would burn. W the problem that you have is that uh, when you ignite, you have liquid oxygen, which is very cold. The hydrogen is also very cold. And after ignition, the temperature will become very high. And as a consequence, you start having problems with cracking on the wall. And actually, one of the engineering terms that is used, and it does exist even the original drawings of the space shuttle main engine, is the Kaiser hat nut, which demonstrates the origin of the design of the engine. And uh, the, this, for example, has, is cracking as well as many other surfaces, including the walls of the main engine. So 
in order to understand uh, why this happens, you need to understand how the liquid of, uh, atomization of oxygen in the real case. And uh, the question is, do I gain anything by doing experiments with water at atmospheric pressure? And these are photographs from uh, DLR in Germany of liquid nitrogen in an environment of uh, gaseous nitrogen. And the question is, do they have anything in common? And uh, we looked at that and we found that uh, eventually the theory that exists based on the Weber number, it doesn't work. We did propose a scaling on the basis of the momentum ratio of the gases and the liquid streams. And uh, the photographs here demonstrate that this is the breakup of the liquid jet. This is long, this is short. The Weber number is the same in these two cases. But if you look at the momentum ratio, it is different. So you would expect the jets to be different. If I look at the other three photographs, the momentum ratio remains constant, while the Weber number keeps changing. And you can see that the liquid jet more or less does not change in length. So the momentum ratio eventually has been uh, a standard approach in scaling the jets for the rocket injectors and even in other applications. And the underlying physics for that is the fact that as you have this high speed jet around the liquid, the liquid jet accelerates. And as a consequence, we did develop a linear stability analysis of an accelerating liquid jet and uh, how the interface actually develops and what waves you have. And um, you calculate how the liquid jet uh, breakup length changes as a function of the acceleration rate, which is similar to the momentum ratio. This is the measurements of from the experiments. And qualitatively, qualitatively, you have the same result. So as you try to move towards uh, the measurements of uh, uh, the liquid jet and understand the details of the breakup, we were on holidays in Spain and looking at the fountain, and I, these are from Las Vegas, the photographs, uh, not that I take, but uh, found on the internet. And then um, what uh, you, uh, you see is that as you uh, illuminate the liquid jet from below, you actually can see very well where the liquid jet goes. So the, the idea then was to try, and we will have a small demonstration in a moment, hopefully it will work. You take the liquid jet nozzle and you introduce the, the a laser light through it. So as the laser light propagates, uh, this uh, will bounce off the surface of the liquid jet and uh, behave like an optical fiber. So by doing that, and if you add also some dye in the liquid, then the laser light will illuminate all the liquid and you s visualize the whole volume of the liquid jet. But then when it breaks, you just diffuse the light. So if I take a photograph at this instant, I will see an instantaneous visualization of the liquid jet. And uh, we are going to, to do uh, just a demonstration of the liquid jet without any dye in it, because that will make pink the floor of the lecture theater, which I think that would not be acceptable. And uh, uh, what you should be able to see is that uh, by using a laser pointer so that it is safe, uh, that the liquid jet that will come after George takes away the plug actually acts as an optical fiber. And you can see that the laser light actually moves along it. And eventually, when it breaks, uh, it will stop, or when eventually you cannot reflect the light of the walls anymore. So as a consequence, we used this technique to measure in the real atomizer. Yeah, maybe you can stop now. Uh, and uh, actually, now you have the liquid jet with a coaxial air. And this is sadographs, the normal way of measuring this. And uh, what you see is uh, what the optical connectivity technique shows, which is the instantaneous picture of the liquid jet, which indicates that it has broken here or there. And you can also do high magnification photographs, so you can start seeing the instabilities on the surface. And we are working on that to try to find out more about the details of the breakup process. We have also used it in a diesel injector. So this is the tip of the exit. You have six holes. You can see a photograph of the six sprays that are coming out. This is a photograph of illuminated, the spray illuminated by light from outside. 
And this is what you see when the light is illuminating the jets as they come out of the holes. And basically that indicates that the liquid jet has broken up at these distances, which you would never be able to understand from these photographs. So changing the application, we move to powder production. And uh, we are talking specifically to washing powders. So you have spray drying process, which effectively is a big tank. You spray from the top. Maybe you have more sprays. You introduce hot air from below. And you expect that the droplets that you introduce here, which include the actual washing powder, to dry and they eventually become big enough to fall due to gravity and collect them at the bottom, which is the powder that goes in the box. So the question is how the final product is formed. Do you have droplet coalescence? Do you need to have, or you can just evaporate the initial droplets that came out of the spray? Uh, do you need collisions and where do they, come, uh, they happen? And what is the outcome of the collisions? And this is photographs of sprays inside the spray dryer. So we took the first and possibly the only measurements that have been done in a real spray dryer, operating with a real slurry, the detergent slurry. And you can see that being deposited even on the surface of the probe. And you can see the laser beams. And actually, the outcome of that indicated that the size of the initial droplets was small. And in order to get the final product, which was one millimeter, you would need several collisions, coalescence to happen in order to form the final product. So we, we used the computational dynamics to look at the droplet collisions. The red uh, indicate no uh, collisions. The green indicates one collision, and the blue more than two, two or more. Uh, this is without the counterflow air. Uh, this is without the counterflow air. And this is when you introduce it. And you see that the initial trajectories go back and you have quite a lot of collisions which happen at this position, as the probability of collision indicates, where you see that it is the, the red line is very large in this downstream position, while without the air it was very large close to the interaction of the two sprays. So as a consequence, the, you know that the majority of the collisions are occurring in this region, and uh, you want to know what is the outcome of these collisions, and you have many options. You have options where they bounce off, coalesce, and so on and so on. You want this, but you can have also many energetic collisions, so where these two droplets just hit each other with a high speed. And as a consequence, you form satellites, which you don't actually want. So how that looks as a binary collision of experiments, so you have two monodispersed droplet streams. You make them to collide. You form a ligament in between. And this is for water. And this is for 50 centistokes, so 50 times more uh, viscous liquid, which is what you have usually when you use slurries. And what you see is that this ligament takes a very long time to break, while for the water has already broken uh, very quickly. And uh, the, what you want is to uh, find out what is the satellites that are formed down here, or the satellites that are formed there, and you measure it. And you get uh, this surprising answer that all the answers, all the, uh, the droplets, the satellites that are formed over a wide range of liquids, 50 times uh, the viscosity, are the same. It was a waste of a, a very painful experiment. Although, eventually, because you observe and you watch what you have, there is something which is useful, which is how long these ligaments last. As you increase this uh, uh, viscosity, you find that actually the ligaments last for quite a long time. If I put this uh, cloud of particles around uh, uh, this collision, then during one collision, this ligament can collect others. So effectively, I can build up very quickly just with one collision uh, the final product. Why the collisions occur in a turbulent flow? So in order to understand that, you go and do one experiment with a pair only, because you know where they are. And uh, you actually have a, developed a system where you can deliver only two particles, exactly the same size, from a, a known distance, and then release them and observe as a function of space 
how the trajectories look like and do any processing you want. Uh, you do this experiment and effectively what you use is uh, stereoscopic imaging, so the same way that your eyes work, you can actually see how the particles move in 3D, but these are the images of the two particles from each one of the cameras, and after you process it, you actually get to resolve the, how is the three-dimensional trajectory of a particle pair moving simultaneously, and you can see how it looks uh, in space. When you do that, you identify what uh, Professor Ricks uh, has called it, uh, RAM, this random and correlated motion, which is similar to what uh, I had done in my PhD, which we called the fan spreading effect, but RAM looks a much better name. So effectively, what happens is that as you have these two particles, because they interact with flow structures, you ca they can either go away, but they move completely in an uncorrelated way and they separate, or uh, they can actually come very close together and collide in a ballistic motion because uh, still, but the, their motion still remains uncorrelated. And this is not considered at all in the, the most common computational models. And we quantified also the percentage of these ballistic trajectories which can occur, which either reduce or increase the distance between the particles and eventually would contribute to collisions. We even developed a computational model in order to do that, so we did our own random work. And effectively, we look at uh, the blue and the red, uh, the fluid and the particles. And uh, you just uh, follow the, uh, how these particles move as they interact with the fluid by deriving basically what the fluid motion is at every position as the particle. And you get a, a random trajectory of the red particles which now go out. And then you compare the result with the experiments and you think these are the dispersion patterns of a thousand particles being released. The blue and the red are the different particles. Experiments, calculations, they look exactly the same. And uh, you compare even the mean distances between the two or the variance. And all the cases actually give you perfect results. And you think, I have a great model which actually can predict and you go and publish it, but actually the model is wrong and there are two errors that are happening. I'm not going to show it here, but out of two errors you get the right answer. And you want also to look at the drying, so you have a levitator that actually can suspend the droplets in uh, space and you have a jet which can dry them and see how the powder actually looks like as it is being formed. We move now to what happens to a spray and you have this unsteadiness. So I have quite a lot of droplets formed here. You have to look at the instantaneous photograph and I have dark and dilute regions which indicates a fluctuation of the concentration, which happens in this case due to the atomization. And it can happen due to the interaction of the droplets with the flow. So you see here uh, a vortex present in the flow and all the particles are uh, placed around it and there is a hole in the middle. So actually you form uh, very dense regions and very dilute regions due to the interaction with the flow. And when you look at the computations, the uh, you do, uh, these are vortices that you, minute vortices that you introduce in the flow, which simulate the, the, the fluid flow, and you see the black points, the particles which are all around the vortices in the middle. And actually, this variation matters. Uh, it's one of the few maths that I'm going to use, because the probability of collision of two droplets depends on the actual concentration of the two droplets. So if this fluctuates in time, immediately this varies and this has an important consequence. So you want to measure how often you get these droplet clusters or these dense regions and you develop an optical technique based on scattered light and fluorescing light to do that. And uh, we applied it in a liquid fuel burner because if you have fluctuations in the fuel that you supply, 
That means that your local air to fuel ratio is going to fluctuate in time, and that has a problem, gives a problem in terms of emissions. So you look at one of the results, and this is the average spray. This is an instantaneous picture of the spray, and this is the difference between the two. So the regions that you have large deviations from the mean is where you form the droplet clusters, and we have quantified the size, but also correlated it with the vorticity of the flow. So this, the black lines are where you have high vorticity, and this corresponds to high probability of uh, cluster formation, which tells you that there is some link between the flow and the formation of clusters. Is it important? This quantifies the fluctuations of the concentration, and it is of the order of 40% of the mean, so if there is such a big fluctuation, then there is a, a problem. And uh, that means that you need to develop a computational model, and this is a photograph of me at Ricardo Consulting Engineer during the Ricardo, uh, in, uh, from, uh, uh, from an award from the Royal Academy of Engineering, where actually I worked on computational models. And this photograph was taken for the Royal Academy of Engineering to advertise this industrial secondment scheme, but eventually they never used it because they didn't like the model. And um, <coughs> they didn't tell me that, but... Uh, <laughs> but uh, you uh, want uh, eventually to try to simplify how you look at these droplet clusters, so you don't want to have a flow because everything moves away, so you want to focus everything at one point, so you want to have a box of turbulence. So you put uh, several, uh, eight loudspeakers all around uh, at, the, uh, at the corners of one cube, uh, and this is one of the loudspeakers, and you start driving them, and all of them meet in the middle, and actually they generate a box of turbulence, very high, but no mean flow. You put very fine particles in it, and you get a random distribution, and you put a spray in it and you start forming clusters, which we are still working on it and we hope to have more answers in the future. At the same time, you want to be able to understand the structure of these sprays, so you want to have an optical technique that can do planar droplet sizing and velocity instead of the point. And uh, we developed this method, which effectively is an interferometric technique, where reflection and refraction interfere, and they give you these patterns which have a fringe pattern superimposed for each droplet. You can see a photograph from the spray, and you can see that each droplet has this superimposed pattern. And if you measure the spacing of this pattern, this is directly related with the droplet size. And uh, if you have circular patterns, uh, you cannot measure in a dense spray because these start overlapping. So you, you use a different optical, method, uh, optical arrangement so that you can make a circular uh, pattern to make it a thin line, but still maintaining the fringes inside. And this is the photograph that you see here. And in this way, you can size the droplets, measure the velocity, and do that on a plane defined from the laser sheet. And as a consequence, you can characterize how the spray behaves. And we went even further. We took two measurements, one is the spray, one is the gas phase flow, and combined the two, doing a particular processing, which I'm not going to explain, but eventually you get blue vectors, which are the gas phase, and the droplets, which are the red arrows, uh, uh, knowing the size for each one of those, so you can look at the correlation between the gas flow motion and the droplet motion. And uh, the you can build uh, unique information as a function of different size. Uh, the velocity of the droplet correlated with the velocity of the gas as a function of the distance from the surface of the droplet. And you can do that for different velocities. And you actually want to try to understand which are the flow structures that influence the droplet motion and the scale of those. So you go and you look at the technique that is called proper orthogonal decomposition, which is used to process the images that somebody takes when you go through the airport and they take your photograph, so that they don't use a lot of memory to store it. And uh, what this uh, technique does is generates 
eigenfaces, so different modes which are picking up different dimensions of your face. And by using a few of those, you can actually recognize whether who the person is and also even to understand uh, what the person, who the person is, if it is happy or sad. So you don't need all the photographs, you need only a few of these modes in order to recognize the person. So you can apply the same technique in a gas flow and actually pick up different modes that happen or different flow structures. You can see a vortex here, for example. And then you can use only those, which actually the three in this case represent most of 50% uh, of the axial fluctuation in, uh, that you have in the flow, turbulent fluctuation of the flow. And you can actually use each one of these modes to see which one is important for the motion of the droplets. And eventually, in this case, mode one was the dominant. So I move a bit now towards the actual applications. And one uh, application is related to automotive, with the car engines where you have droplets and flames. And we have covered over the years either uh, spark ignition engines or diesel engines, and at the same time, uh, different uh, modes of combustion, uh, the different fuels and different exhaust after treatment. One of the questions is related to the Honda engine, which was uh, the gasoline, which is trying to understand when, uh, you have how you can increase the lean limits by actually stratifying the fuel. You can see two types of optical engines, one where you can see through the optical uh, cylinder liner, uh, and the one which you can see only at a certain section of the top. You can see even the flame inside the engine. And there is a mirror from below. You can see through the piston, and you can see the blue light uh, and measure the characteristics. An important outcome is that eventually by measuring the droplets, you find that as they come in through the inlet valves, they are all, the majority concentrated at a particular location, and this links at this location actually inside the cylinder, and there is a particular combination with the air motion and the time that you put these droplets at the right location inside the cylinder, which makes sure that you have a good axial stratification so close to the spark plug, you get a rich mixture so that you can ignite the flame well. However, this changes from one cycle to the other because the interaction of a spray with a valve is not always uh, the same, but it is random. So sometimes you get droplets going at a good location, and sometimes you get droplets going to the bad location, and as a consequence, you get variation. And we actually verify that in practice and we found that indeed this type of, uh, you get good and bad cycles inside the engine, and there is a change in the droplet distribution, which actually influences the way that the, uh, the engine operates. And we even measured very close to the spark plug what was the air to fuel ratio, and we confirmed that when the air to fuel ratio is close to stoichiometry, you get a, a faster flame propagation, and eventually we link that with the way that the uh, droplet distribution behaves inside the engine. Moving to new uh, type of uh, operation, you have the normal spark plug. In this case, you have no spark at all, so you use compression ignition. Thermodynamically, this gives you some advantages, and also there are advantages in terms of emissions. And if I play this video, you see the piston coming up. The spark happens now and ignites. While here you got an ignition of the mixer without really any spark, but just due to compression. And uh, the differences between the two and the understanding how this happens and even the control of how this happens is very important in order to be able to control this process. And these are measurements of the temperature distribution inside the cylinder. So you see for two operating conditions, the temperature distribution shifts from the side on the right to the center, and this has a consequence of where it is most probable to ignite the mixture, and here it is in the middle, and the other is on the side of the right. And we did also a combination of velocity, temperature, velocity, temperature, and ignition studies for two different conditions, and this allowed us to explain where the ignition actually occurs and explain how to control it. In order to control this situation, this type of modes of combustion, you need to introduce uh, exhaust gases to slow down the reaction. 
and actually we develop a probe that allows you to measure simultaneously the temperature and the exhaust gases inside the cylinder. You need to inject the fuel in, so you need to have uh, particular uh, injectors in order to do it. So we use a refractive index model, a, 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 a Pyspex model of the injectors in order to look inside. This is the hole through which the, the fuel is flowing. And this is what happens when you put this magic refractive index fluid because you don't have any structure anymore within the Perspex model, which is important because you can pass laser beams through it with no refraction and take measurements. So if you do that in a gasoline injector, uh, you find these are the measurements of the velocity and this is the exit hole, which you have on the top. And if you look inside the hole, you do actually see that you have cavitation of the liquid, which is a problem because the cavitation destroys the nozzle. And you have either cavitation close to the wall or cavitation in the middle. And this is a video that shows how both modes can actually occur inside this hole in real time. And this happens because when you have the central bit of the cavitation, the flow is swelling, so you have a bathtub effect, so you get this vortex in the middle, uh, while when the flow goes straight through the hole, you get separation of the flow and cavitation close to the wall. We did the same thing in a diesel injector, looking, for example, at this part of a diesel injector, you can see the measurements, and these are computational uh, results. And uh, we can also use the planar droplet sizing technique that I showed earlier to measure the spray characteristics downstream of the gasoline direct injection. And these are results of how the flow of different droplet sizes are inside the spray. And we're going to do that at high pressure. So we built this high pressure temperature chamber, which sometimes may explode. Uh, and uh, as a consequence of this, uh, uh, we can run at 50 bar, 1,000 K, and we can see how the sprays look like inside the chamber. And this is a video of the diesel spray as it is injected inside this chamber. And you can optically then measure different quantities. If you go to a jet, uh, which is uh, a diesel spray, it's an unsteady jet, the important thing is that you want to ignite it. So there are models uh, of how this ignition occurs, but you need to measure what is called the scalar dissipation rate, or the mixing rate of the fuel with the air. And this is very important in terms of igniting the spray. And if this scalar dissipation rate is very high, you don't ignite very close to the nozzle, that assists to premix the fuel with the air and that reduces the emissions. And uh, we can look now in real diesel engines or optical diesel engines and study how the uh, sprays behave inside and how the combustion occurs. We can look at uh, how you calculate the control of the real engine and how the engine operation map behaves at different conditions. And uh, even to try to understand how transient behavior uh, of the engine, which is this shows the speed changing, and also how the uh, emissions from uh, NOx emissions of this case behave and how they compare for steady and unsteady conditions, which helps you to develop new control strategies. And even try to change the fuel in a real engine. So instead of using a diesel engine, for compression ignition, you put <coughs> gasoline fuel in, and there are actually advantages, which you can see here. If you burn diesel fu uh, gasoline fuel in a diesel engine, uh, you actually reduce quite a lot the emissions, although there are some disadvantages at the same time, and this is something that we are working currently in collaboration with. Sir. And we even do science, uh, so chemistry, and uh, the, um, to, to follow the head of the department, uh, and uh, you look at the N-butanol and the chemistry in it, and you have uh, various conformers that may be present, and all of them can survive uh, because the, uh, at these temperatures, which are all uh, present in the combustion environment, and you need to understand how each one of those actually affect the uh, reactivity, and this is something that we do by using quantum mechanics calculation in collaboration with the chemistry department. 
And finally, we look what happens when you inject urea in the exhaust upstream of the catalyst, and urea helps to reduce NOx emissions, satisfy the emission regulations, and as a consequence, uh, probably all the diesel cars in the future will include a urea injector. Gas turbine combustors, uh, the, again, you have flames and droplets, either gaseous fuel or liquid fuel. We'll try to develop sensors to look at the mixer formation, uh, understand how the mixer formation affects emissions, combustion oscillations, advanced injection systems, and even how the fuel droplets interact with the flame. And what we use is the color of the flame. So if you have a gas uh, uh, hob at home and you see basically something like that, the color changes, and this is related with how strong the mixture is, the air to fuel. And if you do a spectroscopic analysis of chemiluminescence at different wavelengths, OH, CH, C2, different radicals, you can actually find what is the, uh, this mixture uh, that you have locally in the reaction zone. And basically, the ratio of these intensities gives you a monotonic calibration, which allows you to quantify that and we verified it even by using detailed chemistry models and there is very good agreement between the experiments and the computations using the detailed chemistry. So we apply that in a real a model gas turbine combustor. Uh, so you inject the fuel here, you have air going in and this is the combustion chamber which is made out of fused silica. And this is actually the photograph that exists in the poster. So this is the flame, this is the combustor. I wear these uh, uh, ear protectors because it is noisy, more than 100 dB. And also, I have to admit that I'm not wearing the safety glasses. It's uh, the safety officer may complain. <coughs> so you change the air supply to the burner, you preheat it instead of 25, 400, and the flame changes completely. In one case, it becomes attached on the combustor. In the other case, it's lifted. And you can uh, use this optical technique, uh, the, uh, the sensor, to actually quantify how the, uh, the air to fuel ratio varies locally. Uh, and you can see that this is what you supply. Uh, and you have quite a large spread around it, which has a consequence of the combustion process. And you can also pick up the uh, source of the noise, which is the combustion oscillations and the pressure fluctuations by using the sensor. You want to understand why the flame behaves in the way that it does, so you need to know the velocity, and you measure it. You combine all this information, and there is this magic Kalovitz number that actually indicates why the flame is lifted in one case, and why the flame becomes reattached at other conditions. But on top of that, your flame is not straight, but it bends, so you have curvature, and this appears in the equations that uh, somebody is trying to calculate. And you want to be able to measure the actual curvature of the flame. So these are images of the flame. You can see that there are holes. There are very funny shapes on the surface. And the fact that you have all these bends, that makes the flame actually to extinguish if the, you overdo it. And you actually can quantify the probability of the curvature and how it changes as a function of the distance from the burner exit which is an important issue in terms of understanding why a flame is lifted or attached. You can measure the, also how well mixed the mixture is by using infrared absorption through a vapor uh, cloud of hydrocarbons. Uh, and uh, when you do that and you pass a particular laser beam and you measure the light on the other side, this light, if you select the wavelength appropriately, it is absorbed and this is proportional to the concentration but it is line of sight. So you want to actually do what you do in medicine, a medical tomography, measure many sites at the same time, line of sites at the same time, and then reconstruct how the, f the fuel distribution looks, but you want to do that inside a combustor, and a combustor cannot have many holes in it because it is under high pressure, but eventually you do drill holes and you pass laser beams through, and because the flow moves fast, you want to scan the laser beam through in order to have, uh, to, and do that very fast, 
So you scan a laser beam through and you take the measurements and you can apply the same thing into a real combustor, which we did in Derby. And uh, this is at a high pressure, the same system, and you actually do several line of sights through the combustor and you can use this information to reconstruct the fuel distribution and for one of these cases you can see that you have a peak of the fuel further away from the axis of the combustor and this is changing with different conditions. You want to, be try, to try to do it in a real combustor, you have a limited number of holes that you can open, so you have usually in the middle a bluff body or something that eventually does not allow you to measure. So the fuel is somewhere in an annulus and this is an, ima a, 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 an imagination of what it could be. And you want to see how many line of sights you can have or how many holes you can open on the wall of the combustor in order to reconstruct the distribution that you know that you have. And this is an image which shows how things change as you change the resolution of the grid of the reconstruction and in this way you can optimize what you can do in a real combustor. And you can uh, also uh, use the chemiluminescence sensor on a real combustor and try to see what the flame does. And finally, you can do tomography of the flame itself. This is an image of how a, a cross section of the flame, a cut from the flame, this is nine cameras observing it simultaneously from different locations and this is how the flame is reconstructed and you can see that at least with nine cameras you can do a very good job. You can measure the spray characteristics of a real pre-filming atomizer. This is used in air engines as a standard. And uh, this these droplets eventually have to cross flames and they modify it. So if I have a gas flame as you see it here and I introduce droplets from the top tube. Uh, you see that these droplets go through the flame, modify it, and they even generate a second flame below. And even if I change the droplet size, I get a completely different flame pattern. And this is important for flame stability. So the last uh, thing, which is a surprise, uh, I would never have thought that I would be working on something like that nanoparticles and bubbles. It is again a random walk, so you get this thing out of the way of your random walk. And uh, you look at now cooling of fusion reactors, and you do that because there is this idea that nanofluids, which is a mixture of nanoparticles and water, that can actually cool the liquid much faster uh, than pure water. And as a consequence of that, we do molecular dynamic simulation of nanoparticles and this is the actual trajectory that you have between a temperature gradient of a nanoparticle and you can see that this happens because the molecules actually of the fluid uh, interact with the nanoparticle and you see that it moves from the hot side to the cold side as you would expect. And also bubbly chocolate, uh, Doug mentioned it, uh, Aero for example uh, has bubbles in it why this has something to do with the liquid? Because in an atomizer, sometimes you can put air in it. So as the fuel goes out with the air inside, you compress it. And then as it comes out, the air expands and you have a very good atomizer for the fuel. So if you do the same in the chocolate, you don't want to atomize it, but at least you want to fill up your aero by something that has a pattern of chocolate and air inside. So this is the end of the random walk. I do not want to predict the future because the future is actually random. And uh, first of all, I had the chance always to say that that's what I was always planning and that was the strategy. But at the end of the day, the university is there to provide the knowledge and actually apply this knowledge to any different type of applications that may come along. And this is the purpose of the university, and that is very important, and that should remain into the future. For sure, one of the things that I can say that we should be doing is to actually be able to measure instead of a plane in a volume, because you can watch better if you see a whole volume in a flow. But at the end, the most important thing which determines the random walk is the financial support. 
And I'd like to thank several people as a part of all this work over the years for sure my random walk trajectory has been determined by these people but it has been determined definitely from Professor Huaylo who has provided the boundary conditions for my PhD I wouldn't be the person that I am if I hadn't worked with him and I wouldn't be able either to at I, I, I do research in the way that I do or even write proposals in the way that I do and I think that it has he had a very important influence and I am grateful for that unfortunately he's not here anymore uh, an interesting story was when I, I started my PhD I had found this poster and actually this poster has the work rules and if you focus on what it says the rule 9 and 10 uh, Jim had come in my room and sat down and suddenly they started laughing and I thought what is wrong and he had seen these two um, rules and uh, he explained to me that this is very important and it took me some time to realize that he was actually serious but uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, as a consequence of that sometimes there was some friction but eventually I think without this interaction that I had with Jim I would never be the person that I became there are many people who actually determine this trajectory Professor Bergeles and Professor Rakopoulos my uh, teachers in Greece they indicated that it would be a good idea to come at Imperial to do a PhD I wouldn't have come here I came because they had done a PhD here before and they were happy with it and as a consequence they recommended for me to come I wouldn't have come otherwise so it is important to keep students going out who are happy so that they recommend others to come some people who didn't realize that actually contributed uh, Chris is here uh, but Jim Gibb even Professor Ricks who is also here when they were working at CGB CGB funded me to do my PhD and eventually they provided the support uh, throughout the years Will Bacciallo he provided the competition when I was developing the phase Doppler it is always important to have somebody on the other side who is actually doing the same thing and probably better sometimes so that you feel the challenge Professor Bill George who is actually visiting now he came back in 88 maybe with uh, uh, in the college and he, the discussions that we had with him actually determined how you were doing things with the phase Doppler Professor Grian and Gusbe from Rouen uh, Professor Grian is here Professor Alan Jones and Marcel Scudier and um, they allowed me to pass my PhD so eventually I could continue and uh, Jim McGuirk he provided many discussions in terms of the modeling Doug Greenalds he has moved uh, a lot but he's also here today uh, many discussions on laser diagnostics Harry McDonald uh, from uh, US we collaborated on the space shuttle and several other projects related to US Gordon Williams he was the guy who suggested to do this uh, as a comment to Ricardo and I wouldn't have done it if he hadn't suggested that uh, Derek Bradley many discussions on combustion John Eaton from Stanford he provided the challenge on two-phase flows measurements and powder dispersion uh, colleagues in Japan from Keio University worked together over many years Professor Okamoto in Shibaura University uh, invited me to stay in Japan for two three months uh, Kachuki and Ikeda they provided support in terms of the spectroscopic methods uh, Honda over the last nearly 20 years have been providing the support and trusting us to do a good job on different pro uh, problems and some of them I present together today Unilever provided the support in terms of the powder production Rolls-Royce over many years and John is here have supported the different directions of the project Catherine Goy and Professor Alan Jones uh, have supported several aspects of atomization earlier and Catherine used to be also in Rolls-Royce Cower 
he was in Siemens, in Alstom, and uh, definitely uh, he has uh, provided uh, support for the gas turbine research. Cell, different people working on different fuels. Ford and uh, more, all the people are here today. And finally, the fusion reactor, the surprise, and Nestlé on the bubbly chocolate. But uh, there is also the Imperial College team that I haven't mentioned it. Alex, I came here to do my PhD. Alex was doing his postdoc. We got on together and uh, we had all, both of us, the same boundary conditions, which was Jim Wilder. And we wouldn't eventually have followed the trajectory that we have without really f having this influence from him. And because we got on well, we did work very hard in order to make sure that the lab is as it is now and eventually move on from the point measurements to the planar measurements or whatever else in the future, mainly because we both agreed to the same direction and we both with the effort to do it. We wouldn't be able to do it without John Laker, who did all the types of electronics that you could really imagine. And uh, you can only do the instrumentation if you have the right electronics. All our technicians have helped. Uh, various senior people in the uh, division have provided a lot of support and ideas over the years. Professor Alan Jones and Felix Weinberg and Kem Enns, uh, Christos and Mike Ricks now, a visiting professor also in Aero. Uh, in Kem Enns, uh, Jeff Hewitt, Omar, and Seraphim. In chemistry, Richard Templer and Patricia Hunt, uh, and related to the Potter Institute. The Nanoparticle Technology Center, uh, and currently the head is Milo. And uh, even collaboration with materials, uh, which is a surprise, with Maria and Gordon. And uh, definitely the younger people who exist now in the thermofluids division. And the people who actually have done the work over the years, you can see them there. Some of them, they have gone to become academics. Pavlos, for example, in UCL, unfortunately. And uh, the Mike Loran is in, um, uh, in uh, France at the Honora. And Stefan Horender is in Germany. Uh, and uh, for sure, the work would not have been done. Some of them have gone, of course, to work in banks, uh, you cannot win it all. Uh, and uh, the work would not have happened without these people. But the most important for tonight, and uh, the reason that I put a lot of effort into the presentation, uh, is actually the people that uh, I believe that have helped me most, which is my family. And I hope that I presented the, the, what I presented tonight they can appreciate that at least I have done something useful. And uh, <laughs> at the same time, I have been working for as long as I do uh, every day. And uh, there is an output which I hope that I convince them that it is useful. So thank you very much. Thank you.